Welcome to my first lecture on Egyptian art. In your readings, I had you begin with The Last Judgment of Funifer from the Book of the Dead, since it provides such a good introduction to the Egyptian religion. In my lecture, I'm going to begin with our old friend, the Palette of Narmer, since it is the oldest Egyptian work we will study. In fact, if you look at the College Board list, it's the second ancient Mediterranean work listed. Only the White Temple at Uruk is older. The content of this artifact has generated a lot of controversy. Maybe it commemorates the unification of Egypt after an actual battle. Maybe it presents a more mythical account of unification. And maybe, note these seem to be the more recent theories, and the College Board loves recent theories. Maybe it symbolizes the daily journey of the sun god Ray and or the balance between order and chaos that lies at the heart of the Egyptian religion. The pharaoh, of course, stands for order, creates order, his defeated enemies for disorder. Do you remember the name of the concept of divine order and justice, a world that is operating properly? It's Maat. I'm not sure quite how that's pronounced, but it's M-A apostrophe A-T. That's an important concept to understand, and probably it's an important word to remember. We'll get back to the question of content, but first, what was the work's function? Actually, that's a tricky question as well. Palettes such as this were used to mix eyeliner or coal that Egyptians used not only to beautify themselves, but also to protect their eyes from the harsh sun. You see this illustrated on the old ceramic tile on the upper right. But the palette was found at an elaborate temple and grave site in the Hierakonpolis, sorry, Hierak Complus, the capital of pre-dynastic Egypt. I'm sure I'm still saying that wrong. Uh, it's also about two feet high, which seems a little large for a makeup compact. Hard to fit that in the purse. So this palette was probably a ceremonial copy of an everyday object, maybe designed to ensure that the person buried didn't burn his, light, his eyes in the afterlife. So let's move on to form or formal analysis. What sculptural technique is used here? The palette is carved in low, or to use the French term bas, B-A-S, relief. Note that the victory stele is also carved in bas relief, but not quite as bas or low. You see how much more shadow is cast by the figures. So what other stylistic techniques do we see that also show up in other Near Eastern works? I hope at this point that most of the items on this list are familiar. The palette does add a gruesome detail to the defeated enemy's theme. Uh, their severed heads and severed penises are placed between their legs. The pharaoh's face is in profile, but again, his eye faces forward, his shoulders are frontal, and below the waist he is shown in profile with the feet moving in the same direction. This becomes the convention for portraying pharaohs. The iconography or use of symbols to convey a message in a narrative is much more complex, however, than what we see in the Victory Stele. It seems to be more disputed as well. But before I get to the individual details, let's start with a very basic question. What are two general ways that the palette reinforces the pharaoh's power and authority? In other words, his right to rule. Again, think of the Stele of Hammurabi, another work that very much emphasizes the investiture, the right to rule of the, of the king. Notice I'm not looking for specific symbols. I'm just looking for two big messages. First, as in the Stele of Hammurabi, there is a religious justification for his power and authority. King Narmer demonstrates his piety. He appeals to the gods for protection, yet he also becomes the instrument of that protection. The gods are working through King Narmer. And finally, he shares identity with the gods themselves. We'll talk more about that in a minute. But there's a second justification for his power and authority. This is one that doesn't show up in the Stele Pomerabi, but it does show up in the victory Stele of Naram Sin. Let's get practical here. This guy knows how to win wars. He even manages to unite the two warring kingdoms of Egypt. Note that the victory stele of Naram Sin sends essentially the same two messages. Okay, now let's run through some of this complicated iconography, starting with what is sometimes called the smiting side of the palette. 
Uh, by the way, I've copied this slide and a couple of others into a PDF that I've placed on Moodle. You may have been surprised that matching questions didn't show up on today's quiz. Stay tuned for tomorrow's quiz. So, what do we see inside that red circle? King Narmer is wearing the crown of Upper Egypt. Note, too, that the king's body is has a well-defined musculature and a wide stance. Again, this conveys dominance and victory. We saw the same heroic body type and stance on Naram Sin. The pharaoh is also wearing a false beard. Pharaohs always do, even, as we'll soon see, female pharaohs. What's inside the green circle? Well, the falcon is the falcon god Horus. But notice that he has a human arm, and he's using it to take a head with a papyrus plant captive. And what does that papyrus plant probably symbolize? Lower Egypt. Note that there's an underlying message about the pharaoh. In the Egyptian religion, Horus, son of Osiris, is identified with the living pharaoh. The dead pharaoh joins with Osiris in the afterlife. So both Narmer and Horus conquered Lower Egypt, or are they one and the same? So what's inside the orange circle? It's probably a goddess, either Bat or Hathor, who is the divine mother of the pharaoh. At this point, the Egyptian religion is still coalescing, and the gods vary somewhat by region. Some scholars, however, think it may be a bull and a symbol for the pharaoh's strength and virility. We'll see that again in our next section. So let's turn to the side that includes the depression for eye makeup. We see the red circled hieroglyph on both sides. It's made up of a catfish and a chisel. The words for catfish and chisel together sound out something like Narmer, we think. So it's one of the very first names to appear on an inscription. Our old art history textbook said it was the very oldest inscription by name. An older one has now been found in India. So how is the king's headdress changed? Check out the green circle. Well, this side shows the king wearing the crown of Lower Egypt, the land he allegedly conquered and joined with Upper Egypt. The yellow circle surrounds, let me see if I can say this right, so-called serpopards. They're a kind of mythological uh, beast with long entwined necks. I didn't know this before, but serpopards actually show up in other Mesopotamian art or in Mesopotamian art. We're not Mesopotamia anymore. The serpa part on the bottom left appears on a cylinder seal that was found in Uruk, Sumeria. It dates from around the same time as the palette. The best guess is the animal is a kind of lioness, again, a symbol of royalty. And finally, in the bottom register, inside the blue circle, we see a bull lowering his head and stepping on the dead. As usual, naked enemy. Here again, the bull symbolizes strength and virility. Later Egyptian pharaohs would be called bulls of Horus. Now, when I've taught this work before in the last couple of years, I never focused on this little boat just above the beheaded and castrated enemies. But I did know that boats feature prominently in Egyptian religion and art. Boats convey the dead to the afterlife. Uh, the model you see in the middle right was found in a tomb, and there were some giant boats found in the pyramids. We'll see that. Uh, so it was put there to make sure the mummy got to where he needed to go. Boats also represented the journey of the sun across the sky. In the tomb painting that you see on the bottom left, uh, there's the sun god Ray, like Horus, depicted as a falcon. The artist helpfully painted a sun on top. Ray is holding an ankh, which... I hope you remember, is the Egyptian symbol for eternal life. By the time the tomb painting was made, Horus and Ray had more or less merged into the same god. Well, we won't usually have the luxury of focusing on just two works in a day. I'm lingering over these two images. Again, remember they were created 1,700 years apart because between them they introduced so many important elements of Egyptian art. So where were both of these works found? Well, they were both found in tombs. And by the way, that is almost always the answer for an Egyptian work that isn't itself a building. But stop and think for a moment about the extraordinary implication for the function of these works. This art was not meant to be seen by living human beings. 
That's actually going to turn out to be true of many of the works we study in this course. But it really challenges our Western concept of art, that something beautiful and exquisite would be made of precious materials and then put in a tomb for use by the person buried in the afterlife. We aren't sure if the palette of King Narmer was intended to help a dead Egyptian get to the afterlife or to help him live well when he got there, maybe both, but almost certainly one or the other. We know a lot more about the Books of the Dead. Actually, the Egyptian title is better translated as Book of Coming Forth by Day. This isn't really about dying. It's about coming back to life. More specifically, it's about how to make sure that rebirth happens and happens the right way. So it's really a book of spells, the sort of book that Harry Potter and his buddies would have studied at Hogwarts, maybe in Charms class, maybe in my personal favorite class, Defense Against the Dark Arts. So here, and I'm not going to read this out loud, is, is a portion of Spell 125, the very act that's portrayed in the section of The Last Judgment of Hunifer that's one of your College Board required uh, uh, works. Uh, and we also see it on a page from a different Book of the Dead, just it would show up in all of them. Wealthy and important people like Hunifer would have had their own Book of the Dead made. But we know from archaeological finds that more ordinary people could buy such books ready-made, and there were blanks left for them to fill in their own names. You saw this on the Khan Academy video, but just to review, the first funerary texts were only written for pharaohs, and they were carved into the walls of the tombs that were inside the pyramids. By the Middle Kingdom, wealthy upper-class individuals could also get instructions for traveling to the afterlife safely, and these were usually carved or more, even more often painted onto their coffins. So here we see an earlier section of Hunifer's scroll. The mummy of Hunifer is supported by the god Anumis, who's associated with mummification and death. Hunifer's wife and daughter are mourning his death, and three priests are performing rituals. Just a little gruesome note, the calf at the bottom just had its leg cut off. Note that the mother following it looks a little distressed. Uh, and it's about to be sacrificed, and we see the tools for performing these sacrifices and other ceremonies on the right. I'm not going to retell the story. I'm going to let you do it. Remember that it reads from left to right. But I am going to do you a favor. The image that you see here with all the colored circles is going to show up on a matching quiz next class. I've even put a copy of this slide up on Moodle in the same PDF that contains the Narmer slides. You can print it up and bring it in, but your notes have to be handwritten. If you'd like to tape it into your workbook, that would be fine as well. In fact, I'd recommend it. So. Now that we've looked at the role of the pharaoh and the centrality of the afterlife, we're going to have to move more quickly through Egyptian art, starting with Old Kingdom sculpture and architecture.